Yeah. Well, maybe we should start. I don't know how this works. Usually when I cover for Scott for something, he's got like very deliberate direct. He's like, if it's if someone is mid-sentence, if it's 1030, you just cut them off and move on to the next thing. Which is a way of doing that I deeply appreciate personally. Um, but yeah. Well, if I haven't met you before, my name is Peter. And um, I've been in Trinity for, oh, about 18 months. And um, in the week, because, you know, we all do other stuff, uh, I'm the director of spiritual life at Christ School, which is basically a way of saying an ordained chaplain. And so I teach, like, religion and whatever's left over over there. And, um, and I run the chapel program. Um, I am in discernment at Trinity. So just to remind the Lord, I'd like to be ordained in case he forgets. Someday if you wonder. And um, yeah, I, I'm happy to cover while Scott is gone. Um, I uh, have a friend who's an anesthesiologist, and she tells me that when you walk into someone's hospital room and, you know, they, um, they're they going to decide to trust you. She was like, at first, I tried to be like a downplay my academic background. And then I realized people are like, why am I listening to this woman if she doesn't know what she's talking about? So now she walks in and she does this whole bit about where she went. So, um, hi, I'm Peter. Uh, I did my undergrad at the University of Virginia in classics and religion. And then um, I did a one-year master's in theology at Cambridge in the UK. And then I went to seminary at Princeton Theological Seminary. So I'm actually a lot worse at bedside manner than my friend, the anesthesiologist. But I may be a bit better at historical and systematic theology. And so... Um, when Scott said, uh, why don't you cover adult ed? I said, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, just do your fastball, play the hits, whatever that is. And so my fastball, the thing that like, where I blindfolded and battered and in the middle of the night, I could still do like the thing that just comes out of me is historical and systematic theology. What a thrill. And, um, I thought as we are going through this kind of Episcopal experience, and as it feels like this is a place where we just kind of bring questions that maybe occurred to us throughout the week or we've been sitting on for a little while, I thought one set of those questions might be unironically theological. And so um, I, I, Scott was like, what would you call it? And I have titled this session Episcopal Theology Amongst Her Siblings, which I thought was a very charming title myself. Um, but the thought is just, we probably all ask, what, what is kind of unique to Episcopal theology? And what are other theological traditions like? And what kind of make them them? And so I thought we could just kind of have a bit of a back and forth conversation, light overview. I have a mental list of things I think it might be useful to get through, but there is no test at the end. <laughs> so I'll go as far as we go, and then we can, you know, call it a morning. But um, is there anything at the outset that anyone would like to ask or state? This, yes, please. I'm curious what the Episcopal Church's um, position is on predestination. What is it? What does it mean? And please, in simple language that I can speak. Totally. Um, is it fair if I say, we'll get to that? Okay, we're gonna get to that. But the bottom line is, like so many other things in the Episcopal Church, there's not necessarily a hard stance. And, and there's important theological reasons. There's, there's historical reasons for that. Um, so I find it useful um, when I teach theology early stuff to rely on this little device that has been called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. Um, Wesley, if you know him, didn't come up with this, but uh, he kind of put it in clear terms and his tradition has carried it forward in a really helpful way. And the Wesleyan quadrilateral says this, there are four authorities, four sources for theology. And, and those four um, are uh, revelation or scripture, Reason, tradition, and experience. That little slappy sound is kind of fun. Um, the Bible, reason, tradition, and experience. Those are the four things 
um, and the only four things that theology uses to do its work. Now, this is not directed. It's not like there were eight options and someone came along and was like, the other four are not allowed. It's just that um, historians of doctrine for <laughs> centuries have kind of noted, no one's really been able to get beyond this. Not that getting beyond it would be good. But it really does seem to be the case that in every instance, every theological system or claim somewhere in the quadrilateral. And I at least find it useful to analyze um, in the th works of individual thinkers, um, the, the works of whole traditions, the position of a church based um, in one of these. Yes. Included either with the quadrilateral edition. Yes. For Wesley, they are. I can imagine someone shifting those around. But for the Wesleyan tradition, yeah, they are. Yeah. Being interpreted. Sure. Um, well, are you asking what if we see the climate crisis as some like a kind of theological revelation or? How would we get a theology to respond to the the latter? More than one. Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, my like theological role model, even though as I get older, I think he's wrong more, and it's kind of sad. But he's a great guy. His name is Jürgen Moltmann, and he's this now like ten million year old German theologian who is slowly moving closer to Jesus in southern Germany. And I met him once, and. Uh, I um, I asked him, like, what is theology? He said, theology is taking something that interests you and shining the light of the gospel on it. And so um, there, there are lots of different ways to think about how theology does its work in the world. And one of them is responsive in this sense. Okay, we've got this big crisis. Feels like things aren't going great. How will the Christian tradition respond? Well, you could do it from a number of different ways. Let's say you're like a, you're a big Bible person. You want to start with Bible. Well, you might start with the prophet Joel. The book of Joel is this you know slim prophetic book. It's very hard to date. No one knows when it's written because it references no battle, no king, nobody's reign, no country. It's just this insane locust swarm that is so big and so terrifying, it may in fact kill Israel. Maybe we read that as a biblical example of an ecological crisis, and we think about how Joel thought through that, and then we think with him. Maybe you want to go on the kind of reason front, and in here you might put uh, modern developments and the hard sciences. And you'd say, you know what, we should start with what reason has offered us and move forward. Mm -hmm. You might start with experience. You just like, you're like, the experience of the ecological crisis is terrifying and awful, and I have now lost my beach house. It has fallen straight into the ocean. And you want to kind of think from there. Um, or you might look in the tradition of resources where other people have thought through cataclysmic events. For instance, you might look at how Augustine responds to the fall of Rome. Uh, like that Rome falls in Augustine's life is just this unimaginable tragedy. No one ever could have seen it coming. Well, I mean, they could in a couple of decades, but for most of the history of Rome, no one ever could have seen that coming. And so You'd say, well, how does Augustine say in the city of God respond to cataclysm in a way we would also respond to cataclysm? But what's going to determine which of those you use is which tradition you're in. So if you're in a, we start with Bible tradition, we start with reason tradition, we start with tradition, tradition, we start with experience tradition, that might change how you how you respond there. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, these are not like demanding. It's mm -hmm. not as though there's like in heaven, God will have a four multiple choice response and you have to pick these four. It's just the observation that really it seems no thinker in the Christian tradition has moved past this. And so it remains a routinely useful way of thinking through how some church, some tradition might do their work. Any other thoughts on this? Otherwise, I thought we might move a little bit to like history. Is that pretty good? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm um, you know, you have to do a psychological evaluation for um, ministry, thank God. And um, the, the woman who um, did my evaluation, she was like, okay, some things about you, you should never buy a couch by yourself. You have functionally no space for reasoning. Uh, you can probably see the way I do that. But the other thing she said is, you know, you seem to be the kind of person that needs a story to hold information together. Now, I happen to think you see lots of people. Why, when you do theology, 
Um, sometimes there can be this very stressful thing that happens where it, it feels like someone has walked up to you and they're like, predestination, yes or no? And you're like, oh, no, I don't know. I'm thought about it and this feels very high stakes. And one of the things that I sort of discovered in my own journey was um, maybe instead of these very intense questions arriving at your door and you have to give them an answer, you know, is Jesus fully God and fully man and fully man? Sometimes you can take a moment, you can chill out and breathe. And what you instead do is go, well, what's the history of this question? How has it been asked and answered before? And um, there is a brilliant theologian. She teaches at Durham. She's Catholic. Her name is Karen Kilby. And like these other genius freaks of nature, she has an undergrad in Yale and uh, undergrad in math and theology from Yale. And she has this beautiful little essay where she says, theology is not like math. Here's why it's not like math. If in math, you can prove something is true, say that there's a square root to negative one. If you can prove there's a square root to negative one, then you can use the square root of negative one as a starting place, right? Like remember when you had to show your work in middle school, you know, you've got this equation up here and you solve it all the way down and then you get a little answer. And in math, that little answer is a new starting place where you can solve other stuff. In theology, not so. In theology, all the answers we get are never free of their history. You always have to know the story behind them in order mm -hmm. to respond to the questions. So what I'd like to do a little bit is to touch of church history, because as you start to think like, what, what does theology do and where does Episcopal theology come from? Um, this is key to know the story of how we got to where we are. Does that make some sense? Yeah. So vaguely in the year 27, B.E. or A.D., Jesus came back from the dead. And uh, that's because the medieval monks who tried to put his birthday at what we call the year zero, they were just a little off. So one, this is sort of fun. This is for free. Welcome. Jesus is probably a spring baby, maybe March or April, and shepherds are sleeping outside at night. It's probably not in the cold months in Israel, probably kind of warm spring, summer. Um, so in all likelihood, Jesus is, you know, not born in what we call December and also not in the year zero. So if you fast forward 30 some years, we'll say around the year 27 on Passover, he comes back from the dead. And, um, that, uh, leads into what we often call the apostolic period. And this is really those 12 fellas and their friends that followed Jesus around. They made it, you know, a good couple more decades. They died in brutal and interesting ways, but they give us the kind of first phase of Christian theology, which is the New Testament. And um, quickly after the apostles pass, Christianity has a real problem. And here's our problem. Uh, people keep killing us and they think we are very weird and uncomfortable. So Christians are routinely um, accused of being uh, cannibals and of incest. Do you know why this is? This makes some sense? In our ritual, we constantly said that we ate someone's body, and if you didn't go, that sounds weird. So Christians are over there eating bodies, and also married couples called each other brother and sister in the early days. Their belonging in the, so to speak, their marriage was in the church. The church was not in. And so, um, what I'm gonna, um, and so people thought, you know, these were siblings who were getting together. That's a little fun. And so uh, we have. A second generation of Christian thinkers who we call the apologists. And um, you may think apologia in Greek does not mean apology in the sense of like, I'm so sorry. It means defense. The apologists are the next phase of Christian thinkers, and they're going like, please don't kill us. Please don't kill us. We make amazing neighbors. We are also very tough. And so this early phase of Christian theology now looks at the world of Greco-Roman paganism and tries to say, you know, we Christians, we are also part of an ancient wisdom, so ancient that Socrates and Moses, they're actually very connected. Now, historically, this is an extremely tenuous claim, but what they're trying to do is demonstrate why uh, Christianity can be engaged with the ancient knowledge of sciences, philosophy of the Greco-Roman world. And the hope is if we show that well enough, people won't kill us, which they continue to do for the next 400 or so years. Um, so after the apologists, we move into a period that we also often call the church fathers. <laughs> and um, we'll say that the church fathers are from about the year 100 to about the year 451, because it's the Council of Nicaea, um, uh, uh, the Chalcedonian definition. So we've, we've got these 300 years in here 
Kish, where the church fathers are continuing the work of the apologists, but they are not being routinely persecuted. I mean, it comes in waves, but the church fathers are this remarkable generation of Christian thinkers in the earliest days of Christian theology, who are trying to build, trying to put some structure and answer some of these nagging and ridiculous questions that Christianity has lived with for the last couple hundred years. Here's a really good one. How is Jesus God? Like, how could that be possible at all? God is infinite, and Jesus was a God. And if you take finitude, if you take one individual, like one little human being, and you put them in contact with the infinite God, won't the infinite God, like, explode them? Won't they, like, be crushed under the very weight of God's own majesty and magnificence and infinity and how how does that work thank you for asking that for instance was the council of chalcedon where the church fathers claimed that jesus had two natures one divine and one human but they were in one individual or you might think okay well if jesus is kind of god but then god is also god and the holy spirit is also god like how do those get along with each other how could three things be one thing but one thing be three things except that one thing is not like the separate three things, because that would be modalism and that's a heresy. You know, how are we going to work through all these tricky issues? Well, that's the Council of Nicaea. And so the church fathers settle very basic, basic in the sense of foundational, not basic in the sense of simple issues in Christian theology, the nature of the Trinity, questions about grace, um, questions about who Jesus is and how he works in the world, questions about where the world came from. This is when Christians around the second century is when we see Christians starting to claim that God made the world from nothing. That had been a live debate in the kind of 200 years after Jesus. So the church fathers are this period in which these early questions get settled. Any questions up until this point? <laughs> well, speaking of questions, I think um, oh. Julie Sitton has her hand raised. Julie, do you have your hand raised? I see a hand. I don't know if it's Julie's. Hi, can you hear Hi, me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Boy, I have an echo. It was just related to seeing the video from last week. So sorry to interrupt right now, but we were interested in this. We talked this earlier, but I can just relay. We were really enjoying this. I've heard some of these references and you put it into, I'm seeing it as a cartoon, fast forward cartoon now, and I might remember it. If I can cartoonify early Christian theology for you, I can rest easy tonight. <laughs> it's fabulous. Thank you. Um, anything else from this period? Um, mentally, we're at about the year 450. Okay. As you might remember from your high school history classes, uh, Rome falls, then behold the Dark Ages, and those last for a mighty long time. Now, I have a personal pet peeve about this. Um, how many of you learned anything about the so-called Middle Ages in your high school curriculum, especially if you were in a public school? No, nothing, almost none of us, right? It just doesn't come up. We know a ton about Monticello, but we know nothing about the Carolingian Revolution. And um, the so-called darker Middle Ages were actually a time when remarkable thought was happening in really impressive ways. It's just that it's been like deeply undersold to us. Um, we can't get into the messiness of all that right now. But if anyone knows the great theologian Thomas Aquinas, or you know that name, um, Aquinas is a sign of how um, Aquinas is a sign of really how brilliant the Middle Ages could be. Um, I had a supervisor who said there's basically no uncontroversial thing to say about Thomas Aquinas, um, but he lived at this. He, he was a, a incredibly capacious mind. And he lived at this period. Um, I had a, a professor of mine said this: "There will never be another Thomas Aquinas." And I was like, "Why will there? <laughs> Why will there never be another Thomas Aquinas?" And my professor, Kevin Hart, not the comedian, said, um, <laughs> "said he lived at a time where all philosophy, all theology, all physics, and all metaphysics could fit in one brain. You know, the library of that was maybe two hundred books large." And I don't know, everyone in here, I'm sure, has their, your own field in which you're a specialist. And if it's anything from sourdough bread making to theoretical physics, you know how wide your field is. And, and Aquinas was, in some ways, the last brain to live at a period 
where you could know all of he could know everything there was in all of these fields at the same time. But now fields have been so remarkably splintered and differentiated. You no, know, no one could do it. Just you, you don't have enough years in a life to put it all together. Um, the next big period that we talk about in the history of theology is the Reformation, um, which we say starts um, on Halloween 1517 when Martin Luther posted his 95 theses to the door. Now, of course, with all theological periods, there were rumblings before, and did it really start that day? No, but it's a really helpful date to remember. Yes? Can I be a pain in the butt and assert? Please. In the Renaissance, the humanists who went back to the ancient texts started translating them and finding them, and you had people like Erasmus, who probably was almost the smartest planets, I don't know. It, it, that had a lot of formation in terms of Interpretation translation of language. Absolutely. Yeah. You've got these some Christian, some um maybe not so interested anymore in being Christian thinkers who are thinking through these deep textual things. And so the Reformation emerges a part in part out of this. Yeah, yeah. This Renaissance hope to like be great if we needed the actual text for Um right about here is when we talk about the emergence of something that is secretly controlling all of our lives, and it's in all of our brains, it makes so many of our decisions for us, we never talk about it. But that's modernity. And this is really, for me, where stuff like historical systematic theology like sort of starts to come home. Um, these are just some of my personal favorite examples to dramatize the change that modernity made. Everybody in here has a shirt size, right? Not in 1517. Everybody in here goes to work at a specific time. Yes, not in 1517, right? In the last 500 years, almost 600 years, since the Reformation, we have seen so many cultural changes on just a technological front. I mean, like standardized time, the invention of the factory, I mean, we're going over this really quickly, but we live in a world that is so profoundly different. It is so modern as opposed to the world in which this theological story had taken place that in a lot of ways, um, some of the intellectual struggles we have, but I really also think some of the existential wrestling we do comes with the fact that we are trying to answer this question, how is it that we bring the faith into the modern world. But we've got a lot of options. Some people might say like, forget the modern world, get that out of here. We're gonna go pretend like it's still the mid 16th century. Some people are like, you know what? The modern world is in fact better than the revelation of God and Jesus Christ. Let's just go with that. And there is there is everybody sort of in between. But um, when we talk about modernity, when we use that word, which is very big and, and almost, um, so ubiquitous as to be difficult to see. That really is where a lot of, I think, um, debates over the nature of the church and what we should believe and how we should be missional and how we should adopt this into our lives. All of that sort of comes into being around this period. Um, this right here, as we've learned, it's kind of when the thing that will soon be recognizable as Episcopal theology emerges. And that's because your friend and mine, Henry VIII, wants a son very, very badly. And um, he thinks that it's his wife's fault, which is super ironic now that we know. Um, he thinks that it's his wife's fault that he could not have a son. So um, he removes the Turk in England from Vatican control. And... Um, well, British theologians are of two minds about this. Some of them are like, man, this Reformation stuff is awesome. We should get some of that over here in England. Let's take the fact that Henry has removed our church from the control of the Vatican and just run into the happy Protestant future. And others of them are like, well, we're happy we're not under Vatican control, but let's not like get crazy here. I mean, the tradition of Catholicism has indeed been our tradition for nearly a thousand years. I mean, why would we? Why would we? And so this debate crops up in the early Church of England between people who want to stay Catholic and people who want to get Protestant. And behold, you have Anglo-Calvinists and Anglo-Catholics. 
And you can tell this in the way different Episcopal churches worship. Some of them feel if you were raised Catholic, they feel very Catholic. Others of them feel like not so Catholic at all. And Episcopal theology, um, broadly Anglican theology, but Episcopal in our version in the States, emerges out of the attempt to keep these people from killing each other, which, by the way, doesn't go so well for a little while. They, um, they kill each other a lot, and they steal things and burn monasteries. It's all very messy. But um, Anglican theology emerges under the attempt to keep a diversity of, opinion, of opinions, at first the Anglo-Catholics and the Anglo-Calvinists, in some kind of communion with each other. And the Book of Common Prayer is really the artifact that emerges from that process. So lots of times you'll ask things like, what's the Episcopal Church's stance on predestination? And one of the reasons we're saying we don't necessarily have a hard uh, theological line is because, um, well, we tried to get some Calvinists who were really big on predestination to continue worshiping with some Anglo-Catholics for whom predestination was not the name of the game. And so because of that, um, you often find that Episcopal theology, that's what it's doing. It's trying to keep lots of camps together all at the same time. Does that make some sense? Would anyone like to remark on that or ask a question at this stage? When you talked about the Anglo-Calvinists, did they bring into the tulip into... Oh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. Um, Tulip Calvinism, does everyone know what that is? It sounds adorable, but it's not. Uh, um, Tulip Calvinism is a, a pretty recent development in Calvinist thought um, that claims that there is a there are these kind of five core points to Christian theology. And you might have to help me. Total depravity, uh, limited atonement, utter dependence, pre pre predestination. It's pre yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's spelled predestination, but it's yeah, they spell tulip as the point. Yeah. Limited atonement. So put those together in a Scrabble game and you get tulip. And, um, uh, and so um, Alvin himself is not um, quite so dogmatic, I'd say, on those five points. Um, and uh, so on the five points of Calvinism, Calvin himself is not quite so rigid. But what's at the heart of all Calvinist theology, and do you know this? Reformed theology, you'd think it's the whole Reformation. That would make so much sense, right? It's not. It's just theology and the legacy of Calvin. If you ever hear someone talk about a Reformed church, you'd think that's the whole Reformation, like the Anglicans and the Lutherans. It's not. It's just the Calvinists. It goes back to when churches were named in Germany. I find it deeply frustrating and hard to explain to high school students, but there you go. Now you know. Um, reformed theology, all reformed theology in the wake of Calvin specifically does this. It lodges the doctrine of salvation within the doctrine of sovereignty. The basic and commanding claim of all reformed thought is that one is saved because God picks you. That's it. And I know that can sound really scary, but at the time, Calvin actually meant it to be deeply comforting, which was in a world in which things are constantly moving and you're not really any more stable than the rest of the world. Isn't it nice to know that your salvation is lodged in a God who has chosen you and not in yourself? That God, that God has reached into the world and caught you while you were falling. And, and not because you tried to fly, just because God did. That chunk, that comes in to Episcopal theology. Um, and, um, and at various times, again, over the, over the last 500 years, people have been able to bring lots of different things into Episcopal theology, and um, we're trying to live together. So, yes? What was the uh, sort of the Catholic reaction during this time? Oh, yeah. Well, the big Catholic reaction is um, um, the Council of, oh gosh, I'm not a morning person. Trent. The Council of Trent, there it is, um, where... You know, Luther thinks of himself as trying to help the Catholic Church. And, and for the early years of his career, he doesn't want to break. Um, in fact, a lot of his writing is trying to get in touch with the Pope, so to speak, and be like, you know. And he, he thinks a lot of the Catholic um, administration is kind of on his side. And, and if no one asks a question, why would you have a clear answer? So then when Luther starts making a real buzz 
as Luther is excommunicated from the Catholic Church, as Luther's thought starts to develop into this other thing, Catholic thinking reacts and has to go like, all right, so what do we think about this? Like, what is our departure from Luther in this thing? And and you can read this in some ways as, as um, a bit of a position. Yeah. One of the things of the Common Reformation. A, a big, uh, maybe a bit of an overreaction. To this sounds so. Um, Catholicism for a period in a way kind of gets more Catholic. Um, I'm not a specialist in Catholic thought, but there, there is a way of telling the story of Catholic theology from Trent to Vatican II, which is a moment where a lot of the maybe spirit of um, Trentian counter-reformation was loosened in a way. And Catholics right now are kind of figure out what they think. Oh, I, I teach mostly religion and a bit of what's left over at Christ School. If anyone has, knows, or has seen a teenage boy in the wild who thinks they might benefit from a boarding school education, please send them my way. <laughs> um, anything else at this stage? If not, I would like um, to introduce us to what I, I think uh, really remain the commanding theological problem of our day. Um, there was a... Um, no, actually, maybe one more thing. All these movements that we've talked about, if you were to take them kind of as a whole, you want to talk about the church fathers, or you were to take a specific thinker, they can all live in various ways on, on this quadrilateral. So this probably is going to come as a surprise. But the Reformation is a moment where people try to arrange the Wesleyan quadrilateral as um, the Bible upheld by tradition, experience, and reason talk to a lot of, um, if you were to talk to Reformation era thinkers, Luther, Melanchthon, Calvin, what they're saying is what we are doing theologically is about the revelation of God in the Bible. Of course, we don't want to get rid of reason entirely. Uh, we don't want to get rid of tradition entirely. We're not saying that your experience doesn't matter, but our core thing here is vital. You might say that Catholic theology lived more in the world of tradition. The Catholic response to this is like, well, yeah, so great that you're trying to read the Bible, but haven't you noticed you get four people a Bible, you get 12 different opinions. Who is going to settle this, the instability and the over diversity? Right. I mean, I'm bad at math, but I'm sure you keep going. And, um, and Catholicism has said the tradition is there to stabilize the knowledge that we receive from the scripture. So, so for, for the Catholic tradition, you and your Bible, like it's great that you are interested in the word of God and you receive spiritual life from God. But unlike Protestantism, where if you had a strong enough difference of opinion, you could go over there and start your other church. Catholicism is saying, obviously the tradition has settled the questions for you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think this is super popular anymore. I don't, I don't feel like I see a lot of people doing this, but if you talk to like the Enlightenment era thinkers of Christianity, say Thomas Jefferson, Reason really leads the way for them. Does everyone know about the Jefferson Bible? Have you ever seen this thing where Jefferson went through and he like cut out all the stuff that he thought um, wasn't possible or scientific or reasonable in the gospel? Hilarious is some of the stuff he leaves in parenthetically, like that John the Baptist survived still on a diet of locusts and honey. Jefferson was like, yeah, totally leave it in. Um, the resurrection's out, but that diet stayed, baby. Um, it's, it's a kind of odd artifact. Um, and, and then there's experience. And um, uh, what, I, what I'd like to do in our last... Oh, wow, we have so much more time than I thought. This could be way more fun. Don't worry, I won't jam more in here. I'm just delighted we don't have to run. Um, is, is tell you a little bit of the story of modern theology and why, this is the punchline, um, punch uh, why liberal theology is the theology of experience. So... so um, has anyone ever heard the name Immanuel Kant? You, you know, high school philosophy, AP Euro, something like that. So um, Immanuel Kant was a hugely influential sort of German thinker in the, in the 1700s. And um, I really think that if Kant walked around America, he'd look at everybody and he'd be like, I see you've read my stuff. Like his way of thinking was so influential. I mean, he really kind of wins the race to be the coolest guy in the Enlightenment. And so um, Kant, Kant writes these three big books that throw theology into a tailspin. And, and at least what I, where I was trained and what I was taught, 
is that pretty much all theology still lives in the attempt to respond to Kant's theological system. So here it is. Um, let's say you're walking down the street and all of a sudden you see red and you feel the heat and you hear like, um, you have taken in all of this sense data, red, heat, the smell of gasoline, loud sound. And your brain makes the sense out of this that you've just seen a car crash. The Kant says that as we walk around the world, we basically, we live in this two-step process. Step one is you, you take in stuff through your senses. You smell stuff, see stuff, touch stuff, taste stuff, whatever. And then your brain, your mind, organizes that to literally make sense of the world. Pretty simple. I think if you pulled most teenage boys, that's probably what they think we do. This has now somewhat been called into question by neurology. But anyway, that's what Kant said. That's what people have tended to believe. Um, one big problem here. God is not like a car crash or a pothole. You tend not to bump into God or to smell God or to taste God, depending on your Eucharistic theology. You, you don't really interact with God on this kind of sense data level. So how could you ever get any information about God? Like, how could you ever, all, the way we navigate the whole rest of the world when it comes to God suddenly seems impossible or not allowed. And at the very least, theology becomes really, really thin at this time in European history. But at worst, people are scared that it's like not possible at all. And that like the whole notion of God has really been this giant, unfunded, data-less endeavor. And in the centuries after Kant, basically two people charted a way forward. The first of them was the great genius, Friedrich Dale Ernst Schleiermacher. See my article in Earth and Alter. Um, Schleiermacher, um, do, you, do you know this story? You, no, you know this story. There's this kid, and he's raised in a very intense youth group. And it's like maybe hardcore Pentecostal, and there's a lot of crying in front of crosses or whatever. And, but he's like thoughtful, he's a little brainy. And then he goes to a university, and let's say it's a university that used to be very religious, and now maybe not so much, like, oh, I don't know, Yale. And then, um, he, you know, there's some very awkward texts and phone calls home with mom and dad, where they're like worried about his eternal salvation, but they still wanna be in the family. And he like feels that they're ashamed of him, but he's trying to keep the relationship. And then by the time he graduates, he's like, I believe, I believe, but I believe in a maybe like kind of different way. And all of his friends are artists. And then he goes and works in like chaplaincy. Okay, Friedrich Schleiermacher was the first person to do that. <laughs> he was raised in the 1700s in a very intense religious community called Herrenhut um, in Northern Germany. And he does his undergrad, he goes to a uh, um, boarding school where he is secretly reading Kant underneath his blanket, I guess with a candle, which seems dangerous, but um, he's reading Kant secretly at night. And then he goes to the University of Halle in northern Germany, which used to be like really religious. It, it would have been like, at its founding, it was like the Oral Roberts of its day. But by this point, it was like Yale. Like it had, it had a long religious history, but like really how intense are we anyway? And so he starts to have this kind of crisis of faith because he reads Kant. And he's like, can we really know God at all? Like I've spent my whole life in this really intense community that was so certain and so sure and so intense. And now it feels like maybe that's melted away somehow. And he, his, he and his dad have very awkward letters back and forth. And he writes to his dad this one that he still believes, but he's become a Moravian. He, he was a Moravian. He says, I've become a Moravian of a higher order. So um, he leaves and he moves to Berlin and he works as a hospital chaplain and he becomes uh, friends with all these artists. And over the course of his life, he works out a way of trying to respond to Immanuel Kant's challenge. And this is what he says. It's okay, Immanuel, that you say that we cannot speak of God directly. Because we were never speaking about God directly. We were just talking about the experience of God. And so Schleiermacher thinks back to his childhood days of this like intense piety and, and how thick that experience was. And he starts to think maybe God is in that. Maybe the way to God is not through certainty and argument and knowledge. Maybe the way to God is, in fact, if I looked sort of inside myself and the way that I experience reality and my profound experience of being deeply dependent on self, 
maybe if I looked deep into that, that is where we start to make the journey towards mm -hmm. God. And that's why he's the father of so-called liberal theology. So you've probably heard that phrase at some point in your life, liberal theology. And the temptation would be to think that it means like socially progressive theology, which at the moment it happens to. But liberal, liberal theology, what it has always meant, what it will always mean, is theology that believes that experience is a reasonable starting place for the knowledge of God. Um, a lot of the theology that has flourished in the last century kind of comes from this tradition. Because like one question was, all right, well, if experience is a reasonable starting place for the knowledge of God, why not the experience of being a woman? And behold, feminist theology is born. The experience of being Black in America, liberation theology is born. That, that they all kind of descend from this Schleiermacherian tradition. That has been one of the ways in which the church has decided to sort of save its soul in modernity, to offer itself something of God in a world that thinks that God really is not accessible to us. God is not like car crashes and potholes. God is, seems very hard to get to. Well, maybe God is already there in our experience somehow. That's been one option. Take another pause, thought, responses. Anyone just want to say the name Schleiermacher? It's a lot of fun. <laughs> It means veil maker, which is ironic. Yes. Stack where becoming rich or doing wealth or something. Yeah, prosperity gospel. Where does that experience, if that's so, then that's a part of the perfect experience. Why? How does that reckon with the other parts of that employment system? How sure. those? Because you could say that yes, this is your experience, and yes, this is like a, but how does that unfairly about that to the other pieces of what? Yeah. Maybe let's take two parts of this. In particular, um, prosperity theology, uh, mm -hmm. there's a great book called Blessed by a church historian at Duke who Amy studied with, I believe, named Kate Bowler. And if you want, if you want like the hardcore all the way history and prosperity theology, I would suggest that book. It's actually really a page turner. Um, prosperity theology in its current form tends not to live in line um, with the tradition of liberal theology. It tends to think of itself as much more kind of biblically grounded. But its historical genesis comes out of the mid 19th century at a moment where, um, you know, Americans were doing really well. We had done some amazing things. We had harnessed steam power, we had the telephone, and we had electricity. We could control the unseen world in ways that were really beyond us. And then someone came along and created something called New Thought, which is like, what if you can control the unseen world with your mind? And so, um, sort of positive think stuff came into the world. And if you roll that forward 100 years and you line up the, what if I can control the world with my mind, with the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you get a theology which is like, what if I can control God with my mind and what would I want if not money? And that's kind of how prosperity theology gets born. Um, the other thing I maybe hear you asking is, hey, what about when experience is like weird? Like, what about these theological traditions that are like, oh, my experience is I prayed a lot and I got very wealthy. Shouldn't we all be like a little nervous about that? And what a great segue into the last thing I wanted to talk about, which is Karl Barth. So, um, Schleiermacher is at the end of the night, uh, is in the end of the 18th century and is a very German thinker, and he really wins. Like, this guy becomes super popular. It, does everybody know that if you're in like a seminary, um, You've got these departments. You've got like biblical studies and pastoral theology and historical mm -hmm. theology and church history. Schleiermacher was the one who got to pick those. He like wrote a pamphlet when the University of Berlin was founded. And they were like, we need somebody to structure the divinity school. Let's get Friedrich. So he did. And we've basically just followed him like ever since. He was hugely influential. And um, so German theology continues in the tradition of Schleiermacher for a good 200 years. And then, um, uh, Nazism happened. And there was an unfortunate moment where people who were very interested in the theology of experience started having this other experience where Hitler was awesome and Germany was going to win the world. And it felt like the liberal theology of Schleiermacher 
had nothing to push back on Nazism mm. with. And so, you know, by the height of World War II, German churches have swords instead of crosses and Mein Kampf instead of the Bible. And there's there is this kind of tragic moment, World War I, where a list of all these German academics signed an endorsement of Kaiser Wilhelm's The War Plan. And it included like almost every major theologian. And so on the eve of World War I, when Schleiermacher's tradition has really won German theology, and here's all these theologians and they're signing on to Germany's war plan. There's one young theologian named Karl Barth, B-A-R-T-H, but it's German, so it's Barth, who thinks, you know, this feels a little messed up. Maybe, maybe Christianity should not be signing on to international war plans. Maybe we need, we need something else. And so this young theologian, Karl Barth, tries to find an alternative to Kant's challenge, how can you know God? That is different from Schleiermacher's answer through your experience that will not lead you to Nazism. And this is basically Barth's answer. We know God because God has told us about God, and that is Jesus. Kant may have said, you can't get up to God, but you know what? That really doesn't stop God from getting to us. And that is the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. On a, on a personal level, I will say, um, it does often feel like God is very far away. Maybe I'm the only one. And um, you have moments of private thought, or you go on a hike, and sometimes the hike and the private thought, they feel deeply saturated with God and God's presence, God's knowledge, God's grace. And then you have other moments where you're sort of like, is it just me over here? And in that moment, I think we oftentimes also have this recognition that like, it's kind of hard to make God do anything. I can't really make God get close to me. I can't make God talk to me. I can't make God make me do something. It'd be easier that way, maybe. That would be prosperity theology. But Bart is this theologian who wanted to remind us that no matter how helpless we feel before God. It is true that God seems always to be running after us. We, every time we try to come up with an idea about God, we really seem to mess it up. And if we mess it up hard enough, Bart thought, we literally become Nazis. Like we, we can give ourselves ideas about God that are so unstable and wanton and at times dangerous. And then, but we worship the God who has reached out to us in Jesus Christ and in scripture. And in this way, God is, is trying to call us back to God's self. That is how we stand in the knowledge of God in the modern world, Bart says. We say, we repeat to the world what God has said to us. Um, if you keep those two, so, um, so he's a hardcore revelation guy, except instead of Bible, you might put Jesus there. If you take a step back and you think about the sort of the different traditions of theology that you've maybe seen throughout your life, the kind of church splits or theological debates that you've seen. Um, in my experience, with a bit of thought, it's kind of hard to find one that doesn't live somewhere on here. And the biggest one, the most determinative one on an academic level, but also in the mainline churches of which we are a part, has been this question over how we will stand in front of the world to say something about the God who knows us and made us and loves us and redeems our world. How will we talk about that God in a world that has little appetite and seemingly no imagination for that God? The two options we currently have come from Schleiermacher, which is to say, maybe we all share an experience and somehow God is in that. The other option is the Bartian option, which is to say, well, God has told us what we will say to this world. We will announce the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. And um, my hope is that having gone through the 50 odd minutes, that this is a relatively good bang for your buck on trying to go out into the world and kind of read it theologically. That's kind of all I wanted to cover today. I'm happy to just go full on potpourri if we have any thoughts, something to share, something that sparked for you. Open floor. Any, anything? I'm going to loop back to the original question about predestination. I'm going to yeah. bark. Um, the word that's sometimes associated with Bart is neo-orthodox. Anyone who had that word associated with him denied that word. Bart was actually coming out of the Reformed tradition. He 
he pushed back against the label universalist. But Mark's fundamental belief was that God would say all people. God would say his yes is always bigger than his no. So he came to that from the reformed tradition. And sometimes we get stuck in thinking about the reformed tradition in two, because that's not the whole part. Yeah. The reformed tradition of lying. Yes. The reason I'm so obsessed with the destination is I have a cousin who's a Presbyterian and the, he's one of the, the conservatives in the church, whatever I pretend. And I asked him once in a brief conversation, I said, I don't get predestination. What's the point? If God's already decided what you say to and it doesn't matter what you do, why don't you turn? Why be why be kind to your neighbor? Why don't you just do whatever because the decision's already been made? And he looked at me, he said, Oh, that's not predestination, that's failure. I, I, and we didn't have a chance to ensure the conversation. So I guess I totally misunderstood predestination or did. No, well, um you can you can think about God's relationship to the world from a couple of possible angles. And people have, you know. Um, early on, so there is a stupid expensive book called Calvin Amongst the Refugees. You know, it's been out of print like the thick dude, like $200. But um, this book makes the point that when Calvin was preaching in Geneva, the vast, um, the vast minority of Genevans were refugees. And when they had been driven out of France or a couple other places, and and Calvin's original message sounded as oh I mentioned it before. Calvin's original message sounded like this: God has chosen you, and will never let you go. And even if you have been driven out of your home, and if you have been cast off by your family, in God there is a home and a father that no one can take away from you. Fast forward a hundred years. That sort of sounds like God picks and it's you or it's not. And people are freaking out. This is also what created capitalism, parenthetically, or so argued the sociologist Max Weber. People needed to like work, work, work to have awesome looking lives. So it looked like God had picked them. And uh, so you went into banking. Um, my, my own personal thoughts on this, and I am not some like great, I appear in no textbooks, but um, it is my sense that the best of the theology of predestination has basically claimed this. Um, God's choice of us is very unlike a bank robbery. Bank robbery is like, we're sitting there at the teller's desk and God walks in and puts a gun to our head and is like, believe in me or I'm taking all your money or something like that. This deep sense that like, if God... Maybe the image we have of God predestining us is God sort of walks into the room and is like, I'll take that one, that one, that one, and that one. I will not take that one, that one, that one, and that one. I'll see you at the end of time. Like God walks out. But for me, the sense is this, that if we believe that God has made all things, then it, um, it seems that there is nothing which would be beyond God's choosing. In some mysterious way, God is the foundation and the cause of all reality. And so on some level, God does the pandemic, but God also does the cure. God does not erase the world out of being because bad things happen, but God also does not seem to be um, totally indifferent. In some sense, everything that happens somehow is held within the mystery of the eternal will of God. And if that's true, then that would mean that anyone who comes to God and believes in him because of his son, Jesus Christ, does so because God has called them to Jesus Christ. There is some way. So my way of trying to explain this to teenage boys, God help me, is to say, you picking God is God picking you. That's what that is. From our point of view, God never walked into the room, slaps us upside the head, and has been like, I've chosen you, dummy, come over here. In fact, it seems that it is in our choosing God that God may choose us. And this is the reason why um, I think 
Uh, lots of us have this sense of like faith is about me doing something, surely, even if it's just believing in God. So you feel like if God picks, why would I do anything at all? And I think I think one way to answer that is to say you doing anything at all is God picking you. Well, it's also lame because if God, if you had, are able to uh, know that God loves you and God has chosen you and perhaps every other person in the world, you are free. <laughs> You are free to do good. You are free to follow the will of God. You're other junk too. I think I end up too much on the other junk side. But it, it, it's not transactional. Because God is love, God's grace has chosen you. You are free to be an agent of God's reconciliation and to advance the kingdom of God and ideas. And so, how do we play? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think out of kindness, let me say, if anyone would like to leave now, I will not be offended and you're welcome to move toward the second service, but we can also kind of move into the yeah. Um Christianity um has waffled back and forth radically on the question of how the human free will stands before God. And it is my personal sense that the best of theology always seems to say something that sounds contradictory. And then for a moment, you sort of like see it and it might fade away, but that moment comes back every so often. And I really think the great writers of the tradition are the ones who have for centuries given people that, that moment. Augustine is really the great architect of the doctrine of grace. And um, remember that whole thing, you can't make a theological point without telling its history, it's not like math. Yeah. So um, there's a wave of persecution in the church. And all of these priests and all these bishops, they mm -hmm. recant the faith. They're like, you know what? Never mind. Didn't mean it. Sorry. I will 100% sacrifice to Zeus. Please don't kill me. And so you get this wave of like dozens of bishops and priests who have made sacrifices to the Roman gods, um, or they've handed over their copies of scripture, which is kind of fun. That's where we get the word traitor. Traditore is someone who handed, traditor is someone who handed something over. In Latin, tradio, I hand over. Trado, I hand over. So a traitor is someone who literally hands something over. And the original trad, traditors were the ones who handed over their copies of scripture. So then the persecution stops and the church has to figure out what are we going to do with all these people? Like, what are we going to do with these priests? And the lay people are freaking out. They're like, were all those Eucharists not real? Like, is my marriage not real because this guy didn't really keep the faith? And Augustine is one of the architects of a response to this. And the response is, no, it's all real. It's still real because God's grace is dispensed through the church, not through these individual personalities. And you can start to maybe see here how questions about free will emerge. Because what Augustine has done on some level has started to push back on the freedom of a priest or a bishop as an individual to be the place where God dispenses grace in the world. Roll this further forward and you get the full-blown Augustinian doctrine of grace, which goes something like this. God comes to us and rescues us solely out of the freedom of God's own interior mystery. God comes to us only as grace and nothing we do earns this response from God. And so it is true that on some deeply profound level before God, we are only inert. We don't have the kind of free will to move towards God or away from God. We are sunk in this world away from God and God has reached in and pulled us out Pelagius is, is his, um, is his uh, enemy, opponent in this debate. And Pelagius is going like, no, people can get better. They can get better. They can get worse. And it's their choice. And on some level, Augustine's saying, like, ultimately, it's kind of not. Like, ultimately, our lives go the way of these forces that are far and beyond us. But the, but the biggest force is God. God is the one who reaches in and pulls us out. And so there's a strain of Christian thought that goes through Augustine, through Aquinas, through Luther, um, through chunks of the Reformed tradition, that before God, between us and God, suggests that we have very little, maybe no free will at all. Luther is a pretty anti-free will thinker. But that doesn't mean that like out there in the world, we don't have exactly what would look like, smell like, taste like, feel like free will. We make genuine decisions. 
with within the realm of what's given to us, we do we make genuine decisions. It's just that we can't decide our way out of the mess that we're in. So they live together in this incredibly messy way. Yes. I was curious about the, the struggle they had with the, the sense of God being picked up and, and difficult to reach. And and I guess I would assume that at that time they were also trained to Christianity, like Celtic Christianity or something, where they felt that they were immersed in God and creation. And did they wrestle with that at all? Or were they just, I mean, Oh, yeah. Celtic Christianity is not super influential at this period, um, but a close relative might be the Romantic movement, which will push back on the rationalism of the Enlightenment. And it sounds very Celtic sounding. Like, God is awash in the beauty of nature, and the universe is one giant bosom that holds us all, and we are at one and at peace with this. And a lot of ecological thought comes out of this. So um, there are definitely strains um, that feel much closer to God. Also, something we didn't talk about at all is like Orthodox Christianity. You know, like God is in the shimmering gold of that cathedral. Like the world is rippling with God's being and, and revelation. And we are much closer to God because we are close to people for a lot of these ones. Um, I want everybody to get up to service. Maybe Scott will watch this and he see I've transgressed his time limit by two minutes. I'm happy to hang around and chat with anybody for a little bit, but I'm going peace to one, sir, for Thank you.